I don't wanna feel this way, but it's not that easy. You're complicating things for me. No, it's not that easy. Maybe just a little time can heal me, but it doesn't feel the way. What are you doing to me? Why'd you break my heart? This is Brad Caleb, PhD, and my PhD stands for Post Hole Digger. I continue to work on the proper foundation for the prodigal son and daughter. What that entails is actually that we are dealing with some commonalities, stuff that we all got used to, and questioning whether this is right or wrong. Because it has been around for so long, does it mean it is true? Some of us don't like to name or term herd immunity. It's an other Christian oxymoron that we will expose. The problem that I have is that often I sit there and check out the news information that has just been released by some corporations that are short syllables. And as you are reading the information, you hear P3, P2, P1, those are Freemason groups and organizations. Then we have comments from people that know everything what is happening on the inside. It is concerning as we live in days like today, during a pandemic. What is it that we are dealing with? And so we need a strong foundation. Because as a merchant marine, when I used to be on the seas, we went through different seas. In other words, there are different types of seas. The North Sea is different than Brisbane, and the Atlantic Ocean is different than the oceans in the Middle East, Far East, and all those different seas. You, you're walking on a ship. As the ship is moving, you have a certain uh, way, and I even start to move this way because Unbeknownst to us as the merchant marine, when we arrived on shore again, it was kind of funny because we all walked a certain way because we were so used to the waves. And if a wave was intense, then automatically your body braced itself. Well, what they are looking for with a herd immunity during this pandemic is that people will be resilient enough to deal with the 
intense pressure from a pandemic because their body can fight it. Well, spiritually, we have the same problem. Is there an hurt immunity for Christianity or for the body of Christ? Or if I may say it more proper and more concise, the followers of the way, the truth and the light. Is there a immunity, hurt immunity? Is there a way of us being a group of people that are protected regardless? And I must admit that thinking about this, I come to the conclusion, folks, that it's almost like a burp. It's a puff in the wind because it is a personal relationship because your mama and your papa and your opa and your oma and their uncles and everything else is a Christian or belongs to the body of Christ. It does not mean anything to you unless you made that decision. So let's see how that effect of Paul, the apostle Paul was in his transition from Nazarene to Christianity. Did Paul become a Christian? Oops, was Paul a Christian? We know one thing, and that when Paul's turning point from being a Jew to a devout follower of the way, I believe the term Christianity was not even known at the time that Yeshua was on this earth, let alone when the disciples, the followers of the way, the truth and the life, the first century believers, as we also known them. Their activities and his missionary activities to the Gentiles, the non-Jews, has played an essential role in the shaping and the development of Christianity. But is that true? It has become a Christian reality, but Paul taught Christians. He taught the followers of the way. And Paul showed great concern regarding Christian theology foundation or what is now known as the Pauline Christian theology. It sounds incredible, but Paul never did this. Paul's contribution found in his teachings where the central point is the death and resurrection of Yeshua HaMashiach of Nazareth who after the crucifixion had risen in glory headed a new community and guided it through his spirit. Well, the new community were the people that were followers of the way. And as much as Christianity like to say, we became a new community, those were the brothers and sisters that followed the path that Jesua was the first one to set. And so as the spirit of God guided those people, it was through the image, the risen Christ, that Paul has come up with the central doctrine of Christianity. And this is where I fight that argument, because Paul never came up with the central doctrine of Christianity. They made it in a central doctrine in 325, like the original sin, incarnation, crucifixion, redemption, atonement, reconciliation, resurrection and salvation. Those are terms that have been formed in and around 325. But if we go to some other believers that believed in different things like Plato, then we will find out that Christianity existed long before Jesus came because the original sin with something to do with Plato and not from Paul. So let's find out what this is all about. We know by now that Christians who profess that Christ is the only way into the kingdom must come to terms and confront their doctrine. Which Christ is the way? Christos or Greek, uh, the Greek word Christ was widely used as a term to symbolize the anointed before the birth of Jesus. So listen very careful what I say. So before Jesus was born, okay, before he was born, 
the term Christus or Christ, that Greek word was widely used as a term to symbolize the anointed. So it had nothing to do with Jesus. Okay, So the name Christian was a word used to describe the followers. So the Greek word was widely used, but the term indicated many pagan deities. In other words, many pagan gods were called the anointed. So when Plato wrote about the Logos or the Word and the philosopher's doctrines wrote about the Christ, did they all know the teachings of the way? In other words, were the teachings of Yeshua discussed or were they discussing the Logos, the Word of the deities of the pagans? See, this is the, the sadness of just following blindly without checking out. So let's check and see what is happening. So during the Middle Ages, most Christians could view the scriptures for the first time in over a thousand years. So here we have a little predicament. Christ, Yeshua, Hamasiah, or Jesus. We are talking now about the person that rose up and went to the Father. Paul writes about him. Apostles are talking and sharing, and gradually they all die. We know that John was most likely the apostle that survived everyone till he passed away after writing Revelations. So during the Middle Ages, so we're talking now from about 100 after Christ, 100 to the Middle Ages, which is about 1,000, 1,200, 1,300 years later, most Christians could view the scriptures for the first time in over a thousand years. They were shocked at the differences and how different their religious practices were compared to the present Bible. So they had been following certain ways of belief. And now they're reading the Bible themselves and they don't know what they're reading. And one of the great themes of the Reformation was to rid the Christian religion of Roman pagan influence. Now, why would Martin Luther, who was instrumental to that, do that? For the essence of the teachings of Yeshua or Jesus to be more faithfully embraced. Whoa! Thus, we have no other choice than to recognize that the opposition to the Roman Church was not only valid, but the very existence of Protestantism is evidence of the infusion of paganism in Christianity. So here we're sorting out a bowl of fruit and we say, this, no, this is Jesus. No, this one is not from Jesus. Folks, we have a major problem by assuming that everything we have been taught today in our churches by pastors that have never gone further than just going to accept what Bible school told them. Martin Luther was a priest in a Roman church. He did not intend to start a new religion. He wanted to make sure that the church was more in line with the original biblical message and rid itself of pagan foundation. In other words, Martin Luther loved God and he wanted to get rid of the pagan foundation. Now, first and foremost, how come that the pagan foundation even got a hold of the Bible? and of the traditions of the believers. And then on top of it, why was Martin Luther the one that got a hold of it and started the protest? That is why we get the Protestants. To what extent did Luther and the reformers succeed? In question only answered by judging the results as to what degree the Roman Empire's paganism remains grafted into the gospel today. In other words, let's find out what we are celebrating today as Christianity or the body of Christ that is promoted. Suppose that Luther and the reformers succeeded and could have restored the original message of the gospel. There are some biblical scholars, A. Powell Davies, who studied the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, the Dead Sea Scrolls were scrolls found in the desert and somebody 
had the guts to be able to translate them the proper way. And there are people like Miller Burroughs in More Light on the Dead Sea Scrolls with these words they conveyed that today has little in common with what was taught by the Son of God in the first century. Biblical scholars were not disturbed by what they found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. They knew all along that the origin of Christianity was not commonly supposed. In other words, what we know today is contradicted in the Dead Sea Scrolls because what Yeshua taught is different than what you and I are being taught in the churches currently. And I'm talking about 2020. For the disciples in search of the truth and life, the answer to this question is imperative. The Lord commanded us to clean our house of all worldly defilement in the endeavor to embrace the things of the spirit. Now remember, we talked about body, soul and spirit. I call it PMS versus PMS. Physical, mental, and we have the spirit on the side of God versus the Satan, the deceiver, who uses politics, he uses money, and guess what he uses? Spirituality or religion. So the Lord did not place the gospel in our hands so we could alter it in the effort to make it more compatible uh, for our culture, or our lifestyle. So in other words, when we get a word of God, we just don't say, well, it doesn't suit me very well because I got to play with my, and then I pick up my phone or whatever game I have on my phone. When God speaks, folks, and we are understanding what that means, then we realize we better pay attention. So the new covenant is just that a covenant and marriage must be embraced in sacred observance and fulfilled to its utmost potential. Whoa, a new covenant? It's like when I got my wedding band, this is my wedding band, June 1976, I promised my wife to marry her and be with her all her life and support her and we would be one. And in God's eyes, when I follow God Almighty, it is a covenant, an agreement that God and I are staying together and that I do my utmost best to fulfill my part, my commitment, so that God can fulfill his commitment. That is how serious God sees it. He sees it like when you are married, in other words, as a man and a wife, those two are intertwined. And this is how God is intertwined with us from a poor, purely outward perspective. There are many indications of just how far present day Christianity has drifted away from the scriptures and the original word of the Lord. I can go on for a long time, but I think it is better that we do that and split it in a couple of sessions. One of our focal points is going to be the Ten Commandments. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord or Shabbat of the Lord thy God. It was further the biblical commandment that whosoever doest any work in a Shabbat day, he shall surely be put to death. It's a sign between the children of Israel and me forever. This is in Exodus 31, 15 to 17. Folks, there is so much that we do not understand because today, who has time for God? We're all so busy worrying. We're all so busy making money. We're all so busy about being concerned about whatever it is. But do you know when you claim that you are a Christian and belong to the body of Christ, what that really means? It entails a commitment from you and me to God Almighty and vice versa from God to us. And when God says yes and he embraces us and we become one, then that means that we are on our way, the way, the truth and the life. Remember, tough times never last. Tough people, they do. God bless you.
This town's so